When the illegal Bronx Social Club went up in smoke, 87 people lost their lives in just a few short minutes. Why did he burn it down? And why did the neighborhood blame her? This is the true crime story of the Happy Land Social Club fire. Hi friends, I'm Katie, and this is Katie Does Crime. Thank you for joining me for the first time if you're new here, and hello to the usual rapscallions and reprobates. Please consider subscribing or joining me on Patreon if you'd like to hear more true crime stories. I came across this story while researching another story, and I'm sure you know what that's like, falling into a Wikipedia true crime hole. So I have no idea why I came across this one, but I'm always especially interested in cases that take place in my adopted home of New York City. I'm Lynn Brown. We have an update for you now on that terrible fire in the Bronx. Overnight, 87 people were killed when someone set fire to the Happy Land Social Club in the East Tremont section of the Bronx. It may have been an act of revenge. The Happy Land Social Club was a Bronx hotspot for young people from Honduras, who were a minority in the heavily Puerto Rican and Dominican area. It was unlicensed, like probably hundreds of others in the city at that time, but the Honduran immigrants probably didn't know nor care. The bar served their native beer, Salva Vida, and gave money to local youth soccer and baseball teams in their West Farms neighborhood. It was a place for the small community to spend time together, and on the evening of March 25, 1990, everyone had gathered to celebrate Carnival, their version of Mardi Gras. So you can imagine the packed house and the excitement that night, and the chaos that erupted when a man came with a dollar's worth of gasoline and splashed it at the base of the stairs in the only entrance and exit to the club. He lit two matches, and immediately that exit was engulfed in flames. He left for the sidewalk across the street to watch the ensuing mayhem. The DJ spinning that night caught sight of the fire before most people and stopped playing, turned on the lights, and yelled for the crowd to escape, but there really was nowhere to escape to. Most of the doors in and out had been blocked so people couldn't sneak in and avoid the $5 cover charge. The rickety stairs to the first floor were the only exit, and they were consumed by fire, smoke, and just a wall of heat. Many turned back, but the DJ knew it was his only hope and literally crawled through people's legs to get to the stairs. He flew down them and out onto the street, his clothing burning off of him in the process. Despite the second and third degree burns over half his body, he was lucky to be one of the only survivors. Now with the door having been opened and oxygen allowed inside, the fire roared with a new intensity, filling the almost windowless room with a thick black cloud of lethal smoke. It happened so fast, the toxicity hit people so immediately that bodies were later found with drinks still in their hands. Some were holding hands with each other. It only took three minutes for the entire second floor to basically be filled with poisonous carbon monoxide, and though people tried to lie on the floor in the hope of finding breathable air, there was none to be had. Most people died of smoke inhalation, although some were trampled on their way to the staircase. 61 men and 26 women all died in the mere five minutes it took 150 firefighters to put out the inferno. One paramedic on the scene said, this is the worst thing I have seen in my career. It hurt my stomach. It was sickening. Most of the bodies were in dance clothes. They were out to have fun. I saw wall to wall bodies, an indication of mass confusion and panic. They had to break into the wall of the office building next door to be able to remove the bodies from the second floor. So who set the fire and why? Well, to answer that, we have to go back to Cuba, the year 1980. 25-year-old Julio Gonzalez, born on October 10, 1954, was being led out of prison and loaded into a boat. He'd been in jail for three years starting in 1974 after deserting the Cuban army, but it's said that he faked having a record as a drug dealer in order to get onto this particular boat. He didn't know where it was going, but he was sure anywhere was better than here, a prison with no food and barely any water. Two weeks later, on May 31st, he arrived on the shores of Key West, Florida. It turns out he had been part of the Port of Mariel boat lift of 1980, the period between April and October when Cuban leader Fidel Castro opened the borders and allowed Cubans to migrate for the first time since 1973. It's estimated that 125,000 Cubans may have come to Florida during that time as refugees or with the help of family in the United States, but it turns out that Castro took U.S. President Jimmy Carter's attempts at a warmer relationship between the two nations as an opportunity to hand off his prisoners and people living in mental health facilities. Many of these people were forced into U.S. jails or refugee camps after their arrival in Florida. 
Once Julio Gonzalez came ashore, he was sponsored by the American Council for Nationalities, a refugee organization that helped him get to New York City and find work. Of course, as a former convict, he was only able to get low-level, low-paying jobs. So when he met Lydia Feliciano in 1984, he took the chance to move into her apartment as soon as possible. She was the coat check girl at a little place called the Happy Land Social Club. When we catch up with Julio and Lydia on the night of the fire in 1990, it's 2.30 a.m. and the two are sitting at the bar of the Happy Land. 36-year-old Julio had lost his job at a lamp factory in Queens. Lydia's family had pressured her to break up with him. He had moved into a $70 a week boarding house room, and he was two weeks behind on his rent. Things weren't looking good as far as them getting back together. Julio was described as quiet and nice by his landlord and neighbors, but Lydia said he was like one of those tiny dogs that try to threaten dogs three times their size. He would never back down from a fight with someone bigger or stronger. They argued over the idea of her quitting her job, I'm guessing because he didn't like her being around other men. When Lydia tried to walk away from Julio at the Happy Land bar, he grabbed her and a bouncer grabbed him. He shouted, she's my woman, not yours. So the bouncer bounced him right out of the club. But Julio stood outside and yelled in Spanish, I'll be back, I'll close this place down. But then Julio just left and the bouncer thought he was good to go back upstairs to the carnival festivities. But Julio actually got the idea to set the place on fire. This was exactly 79 years to the day from the city's second most deadly fire in history when 146 people were killed at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory in Manhattan. So I'm wondering if he got the idea because some mention of the factory fire was made on the news that day. Whatever the case, Julio walked toward a gas station three blocks away, found an empty oil container, and got a dollar of fuel. It was illegal to buy gas in a container, but someone at the gas station told the attendant he knew Julio was fine. The poor attendant later had to find out that he helped a guy kill 87 people his first day on the job. As Julio stood pouring gas all over the entranceway minutes later, several people upstairs saw his shape down below, but couldn't make out what was happening and, of course, never assumed it was anything nefarious. Luckily, Julio's ex-girlfriend Lydia was one of the first to see the fire from her perch at the coat check just inside the upstairs door, and she led a group of a few patrons out a side door that no one really knew about. Lydia, those people, and the DJ who ran through the fire were the only six survivors that night. It's so tragic to think that all of those completely innocent people died because one guy down on his luck got his ego bruised. By 5 a.m., rescue services reported at least 87 people dead. And as dawn filtered over the barrio, people made their way to the scene of the fire to find out what happened and to see if any loved ones were trapped inside. When police interviewed Julio's ex-girlfriend Lydia later that day, she offhandedly mentioned that she'd had an angry fight with Julio just before the fire. A light bulb went off in their heads. When Julio opened the door to his 8 by 10 foot room for them later, all they could smell was gas. He'd come home the night before, thrown off his clothes, and just fallen asleep in his twin bed with the picture of Jesus taped to the wall beside it. When the cops asked him to come to the station with them, he did it willingly, in his gas-smelling shoes. They said they basically didn't even need to ask him any questions. By the time they were making him a cup of coffee, he was already sobbing and confessing. He said he did it to get back at his ex-girlfriend. Julio was charged with 87 counts of second-degree murder in furtherance of arson, 87 counts of second-degree murder by depraved indifference to human life, one count of attempted murder, and two counts of arson. He was considered at risk for ending his life in jail. His lawyer tried to pursue an insanity defense, but the court declared him fit for trial. He was convicted of arson, assault, and 174 counts of murder, two for each of the 87 victims, and the jury foreman actually said the word guilty all 176 times. It took over five minutes to read the verdict, and you can imagine the grief and relief in the courtroom during those long minutes. Julio was sentenced to 25 years to life on each count. However, in New York, sentences don't pile on top of one another for crimes that all happened as one act, so he would technically be eligible for parole after 25 years. At a 2015 parole hearing, he said he had nothing against the people inside the Happy Land Social Club and really didn't even know how many people were there. He just wanted to punish the bouncer. He was denied parole and died of a heart attack in prison one year later on September 13, 2016. Julio Gonzalez was 61 years old. 
In the aftermath of the fire, clerks at City Hall combed through their files to see how this social club that was clearly not up to code with its lack of windows and exits had been allowed to exist. It turns out that Happy Land had been found to have multiple code violations in November 1988 and was cited for having no fire exits, sprinklers, emergency lighting, nor alarm system. It was ordered to close. And yet it seems that no one had ever bothered to check that it actually did close, or the police came by in the middle of the night when it appeared to be closed, so it just continued to operate illegally. Jay Weiss, husband at the time to actress Kathleen Turner of Romancing the Stone, The War of the Roses, and Friends, was the head of the corporation that rented out the building to the Happy Land Club operator. The Bronx DA initially decided not to press criminal charges against him as a landlord, nor against the owner of the building, because they'd actually served the club operator an eviction notice before he died in the fire. But the mayor at the time, David Dinkins, decided to make an example of the owner and landlord, and filed five misdemeanor charges against them. Both signed plea bargains for 50 hours community service and $150,000 toward a Bronx community center for Hondurans. The mayor also triggered his social club task force to sweep the city and close down the remaining illegal clubs. The task force had technically been in operation for two years at that point after another fire in an illegal club sparked its creation, but it had been allowed to basically become dormant. In 1995, the families of the victims received a $15.8 million settlement from the owner of the club and insurance companies. Today, the site of the former Happy Land Social Club is a tax preparation business and a pharmacy, just some normal stores on a normal Bronx block. A memorial for the victims stands across the street from where the Happy Land once was, and all 87 names of the victims are etched in its stone. The street nearby has been renamed the Plaza of the 87. And Jay-Z remembers them in his song, You, Me, Him, and Her, in which he says that the fire he spit burned down Happy Land Social Club. Okay, Sean. The ex-girlfriend who survived, Lydia Feliciano, was given a lot of flack after the incident by those who lost their family members that day. They scorned her for showing her face at the Red Cross Help Center that had been set up for the victim's families. But she said, I lost people too. I lost friends. They wondered how she managed to escape when almost no one else had, and if she even bothered to scream fire when she saw it up close from the coat check. She didn't call the fire department because she said that she was afraid Julio would attack her out on the street. She just got into a cab and rode away as fast as possible, assuming someone still at the club would call 911. Today, it appears that she still lives in New York City and is a grandmother. But I'd love to know what you think. Can you fault someone for saving herself when most people died within mere minutes? Let me know in the comments. Thank you for tuning into my YouTube video. I'm just a true crime fan like you are, and I really appreciate you taking a chance on me. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel if you like spending this time together. I'd be so appreciative. Until next time, I'm Katie, and this has been Katie Does Crime. It was a place for the small community to spend time. Community. Community. When 146 people. When, when 100. It was illegal to buy gas in a container, but someone at the gas station told the attendant, of a few patrons out an outside door that no one really knew about. <laughs> out an outside door. He was already sobbing and confessing. He said it to ja. He said it. <laughs> he just wanted to punish the bouncer. Punish. Why did this cumin immigrant do it? Cumin? Cumin! I got problems today.